there is a Zerlindo. I, I think there is a pop-up window in the PPT. So we have Dr. Clarissa Zerlindo. She is the she is working as associate professor in the Department of Micro, Microbiology at uh, uh, at Negrims. She have over. She is working with Negrim since two thousand and ten, and I think is, is the screen visible to everyone? Okay, so she is working with Negrim since two thousand two thousand and ten, and she is or she is she have around twenty three publications till date. She has also worked as a specialist in microbiology at the Pasteur Institute of Meghalaya prior to this. Then the next expert we have is can you go to the next slide? The next expert we have with us is uh, Mrs. Ivandega de Chine. The next slide, please. No, Ivandega de Chine. She is working as senior nursing officer in the Department of Microbiology at Negrims, who she has over 20 years of experience, and she is one of the recognized trainers by National Institute of Health and Family Welfare on IPC. The can you come to the next trainer, please? Now, next we have with us is Mrs. Lily Chisi. She, hey, she is working as senior nursing officer in the Department of Microbiology at Negrims. She have done her BC nursing from Ripan as well in 2004. And she is also one of the recognized master trainers on IPC by National Institute of Health and Family Welfare Delhi. Next, the next trainer, please. Then we also have with us Ms. Rebecca Webby. She is a next, uh, she is a nursing officer in the Department of Medical ICU at Negrims. We, we have done her basic nursing for Negrims in 2012. And she is one of the uh, one, she is one of the she's attended many original workshop and national level workshop and one of the members of the TNAI Association. So that we have these are our trainers for today. What we'll do is now. Uh, I request you to not, if you have any like urgent questions, not to raise hands right now. What you can do is we can take the questions later on. But if you have something query now, you can ask. Uh, this is Alpana Hachong. I think you have raised your hand. Or you can lower your hand if there is no question. Okay, so uh, I guess there is no question. So what we'll do is we'll start with the session now. I would request. So good afternoon, everyone. Can anyone can everyone see the slide? <laughs> yes, so, we can see the slide. So I'm going to start on in uh, on the importance of hand hygiene. Hand hygiene, as we all know, it's very very important. And wherever we do any infection control training program, we always start with hand hygiene. So first of all, I would like to thank. Uh, Ms. Banashri Holoi, as well as Nanuka Thapa, the team from Japego, who has given us this opportunity and is assisting us in this training program. So thank you, the team from Japego. So regarding the outline of what I'm going to talk about today, we're going to talk on the definition, impact, and burden of healthcare-associated infection, the major patterns of transmission of these healthcare-associated germs, with a particular focus on the hand transmission, I'm going to talk about hand hygiene and prevention of healthcare associated infections, the WHO guidelines on hand hygiene and why, when, and how to perform hand hygiene in healthcare. 
So coming to the first part, that is a definition, impact, and burden of healthcare-associated infection. Even though my topic is on hand hygiene, what I want to introduce is regarding the healthcare-associated infection. Finally, everything that we are doing in terms of infection prevention and control is all aimed towards the prevention of healthcare-associated infection happening. So because of these infections which are prone to ha happen in a hospital setup, that's why we are concentrating on the preventive aspects of uh, this uh, infection prevention and control. So regarding the healthcare associated infection, you must have heard it as nosocomial or hospital infection. So these are also referred to as nosocomial or, ho or hospital infection. So these are infection occurring in a patient during the process of care in a hospital or other healthcare facility. And this infection, was not present or incubating at the time of admission. <clears throat> so apart from this, it also includes infections which are acquired in the healthcare facility, but appearing after discharge of the patient and would also include occupational infections among healthcare workers or the facility. So when we talk about healthcare associated infection, we not only talk about infection to the patients, but we also talk about occupational infections which could happen to a healthcare worker while giving healthcare services. So regarding the healthcare in, uh, associated infection and the estimate, what is the burden of healthcare associated infection? So the estimates are hampered by limited availability of reliable data. Nobody has all around the world, there's no reliable data regarding what is the burden of healthcare associated infection. So the burden both inside and outside healthcare facilities is unknown in many countries and no country, no healthcare facility, no healthcare system in the world, it can claim to have solved the problem. So nobody knows how to <laughs> handle, it means there's no country or healthcare facility which can actually boast of having 0% of healthcare associated infection. In fact, each and every uh, Healthcare facility, be it in the developing countries or the developed countries, they always have healthcare associated infection. So the main aim is to control these types of infections. So the estimated rates, you can see it can affect hundreds of millions of people worldwide. And you can see in developed countries, five to 10% of patients acquire one or more infections. Whereas in developing countries, it is much higher as compared to the developed countries. So it is two to 20 times higher than developed countries and proportion of patients which are affected can even go beyond 25%. So up the healthcare associated infections can happen in more than 25% of those admitted. So in intensive care units, HCAI, it affects about 30% of patients and the mortality may reach up to 45%. So they have a significant impact on the mortality of patients, because once a healthcare associated infection happen in a patient, the patient may eventually die as a result of the infection. So what is the impact? Okay, it can cause many, uh, it, ha it has many impact, this uh, healthcare associated infection. It can lead to more serious illness. For example, a person may come to the hospital with no infection, but may acquire the infection in the hospital and this can lead to more seriousness of the condition. And it can lead to a prolongation of stay of the particular patient in a healthcare facility. It can lead to a long-term disability. It can increase the mortality of the patients and also has a high additional financial burden on the hospital. In addition to that, there's also a personal cost. Okay, the patients and their families have to handle a high personal cost because it becomes expensive to treat these patients. So what are the most frequent sites when we talk about healthcare associated infections? What are the most frequent healthcare associated infections happening? So it can happen in the form of a urinary tract infection, especially in patients having urinary catheters or those who had invasive procedures. The patient may get a lower respiratory tract infection. You have heard of a ventilator associated pneumonia, which is uh, uh, which is uh, involved when there's a which which happens when there's a mechanical ventilation involved. 
And a lower respiratory tract infection can also result as a result of aspiration or nasogastric tube introduction. <coughs> Some patients can get surgical site infections due to inadequate antibiotic prophylaxis or as a result of incorrect surgical skin preparation or the wound care is not taken care of properly or blood infections. So you can see the blood infections it most frequently occurs in those patients having a vascular catheter and uh, very uh, young patients as well as patients in the critical care unit. So these are the infections which mostly happen okay, in the hospital setup. So one of the things is that what contributes to these infections is that there's evidence that the lack of hand hygiene usually contributes to all of these infections. So can you try this uh, question? Can you solve this question? You can uh, just type in the chat box. What is the most frequent source of germs, according to you, which are responsible for healthcare-associated infections? Is it the hospital's water system? Is it the hospital air or the germs already present on or within the patient? Or is it the hospital environment or from the surfaces? So the correct answer is actually C, germs which are already present on or within, within the patient, these are the most frequent source of germs which are responsible for a healthcare associated infections. That's why we always stress on doing hand hygiene before you approach the patient and after handling the patient. So. Okay, so the... Another part is of what are the modes of transmission of healthcare associated infection? And we will do a particular focus on the hand hygiene. So you must be knowing how germs are being transmitted, how microorganisms are transmitted to cause healthcare associated infection. So number one is that the mode of transmission, it can be through direct contact. And the source is usually the patients or the healthcare workers in this place. And what do you mean by direct contact? Direct contact is a person-to-person -person contact. Okay, for example, as I've shown in the slide, it can be uh, through transmission by shaking hands or when handling the patient, when touching the patient while giving a bath to the patient or when doing an abdominal palpation or handling the patient's blood or other body fluids of the patient. So this is a case, an example of direct contact. So another mode of transmission is through direct, indirect contact. So when we say indirect contact, we mean that we contact, we have contact with the medical devices, the equipments, endoscopes or objects, which are, means where, means these uh, medical devices are being handled by the patient as well as being touched by the healthcare worker as well, okay? That's for example, transmission by not, changing gloves. For example, you're handling a medical equipment, but you've not changed gloves. And the same medical equipment, as for example, sharing a stethoscope, you're taking to another patient and using the same stethoscope. So this is another, it's a method of transmission by indirect contact. So transmission can also occur through droplet. So when we use the term droplet, these are actually particle droplets, which are more than five micrometer in size. Okay, and these have the capability of trans transmitting the microorganisms from one patient to the other. So how are they transmitted these droplets? Through sneezing, talking, coughing, suctioning. All these can happen through, drop. Uh, this infection can happen through dro droplet transmission. Another mode of transmission is through airborne. See, a, a, a droplet particle is more than five micrometer in size, but an airborne particle is lesser than five micrometer in size. So when it is lesser, it tends to stay in the uh, surfaces. It tends to stay in, uh, means in the air for a pro prolonged period of time as compared to a droplet because a droplet will be heavier. It's a bigger particle. So it tends to settle on the surfaces much faster as compared to the airborne. So the mode of transmission of airborne is usually through 
breathing. Okay, it can happen through breathing. So the source of these airborne particles are the patients, the healthcare workers, hot water. Okay, during steam, steam may also have these airborne particles as well as dust. So the other modes of transmission include food, water, or medication. So you have to remember that these can also transmit the infection among the uh, patients and as well as the healthcare workers. For example, when you're drinking contaminated water, it can lead to diarrhea, or even during unsafe injection practices, it can lead to certain infections like hepatitis B infection or HIV infection. Okay, so another question which I'm putting forward to you, which of the following is the main route of cross-contamination of potentially harmful germs between patients in a healthcare facility? Is it A, the health care workers' hands when not clean, B, air circulating in the hospital, C, patient's exposure to colonized surfaces, example, the beds, chairs, tables, floors, or is it D, sharing non-invasive objects, for example, stethoscopes, pressure cuffs, etc., between patients? So can you uh, give the answer in the chat box? So most of you have correctly selected A, health workers' hands when not clean. It's a principal mode of transmission of harmful germs between patients in a healthcare facility. Even though I've told you the different modes of transmission, okay, airborne, droplet, direct contact, indirect contact, or through vehicle transmission, yet the most common is a healthcare worker's hands when not clean. Okay, so hand transmission, these are the most common vehicle to transmit healthcare associated infections. And how are they transmitted? I'll show you certain pictures, the steps in which they are transmitted from a healthcare worker to a patient or from a patient to a healthcare worker. So you can see here, this is the first step in the transmission. You can see that there's a patient lying in the bed in the ICU. So all these purple dots are the germs, all right? So you can see that the patient is lying, the surrounding, the patient has transmitted some microorganisms even to the surrounding surfaces. Okay, because what happens is that nearly 1 million skin squams, skin squams are usually skin scales, you know, shedding of the skin happens. 1 million skin scales containing the viable germs are shed daily from the normal skin. So you can see that the patient, even though the patient is lying in the <coughs> bed, but has managed to shed some microorganisms to the surrounding objects as well. Okay, so that is the first step. That is when the patient is colonized by a microorganism. The next step, you can see that is a healthcare worker taking care of the patient. So the healthcare worker, you can see that the germs are being transmitted to the healthcare worker's hands in this case. So just look at the examples. Nurses could contaminate their hands with 100 to 1,000 colony forming unit of Klebsiella species, even during clean activities. So even though you're doing clean activities like lifting patients, taking the patient's pulse, the blood pressure or oral temperature, some germs are usually transmitted from the patient to a healthcare worker. And 15% of nurses working in isolation unit carry a median of 10,000 colony forming unit of Staphylococcus aureus on their hands. And in a general facility, you, you see that there's some colonization by the Staphylococcus aureus, which is a gram-positive bacteria, as well as gram-negative bacilli as well. So you can see in this way that germs from the patient is being transmitted to the healthcare worker taking care of the patient. So number three, you can see that already the healthcare worker's hands have certain microorganisms, all right? So following contact, with the patients or in a contaminated environment, these germs, they can survive for approximately two to 60 minutes in the healthcare worker's hands. So if the healthcare workers, worker doesn't take care, okay, doesn't do any hand hygiene during this particular period, it can they can transmit the infection to the other patients as well as to themselves. So the, in the absence of hand hygiene, what happens is that there will be a higher degree of hand contamination means you can, even if you go to another patient, 
you'll get the microorganisms from the other patient as well. So the, the, that burden, that microbial burden in your hands actually become much, much more as the, if you don't do any or perform any hand hygiene. So defective hand cleansing also, most of the people actually, they do wash their hands, but they do not wash it in the proper manner. All right, so insufficient amount of product, for example, diluted soap, Okay, when there's no lather, you could, when you wash your hands, there should be sufficient amount of lather. And when you take uh, even a hand uh, sanitizer, there should be a sufficient amount of hand sanitizer in your hand. All right, because if you do not do this uh, procedure, what will happen is that it the hands, your hands will still be contaminated. All right, so it'll be the hand decontamination will not be sufficient enough to prevent infection. So here also cross transmission. So if a healthcare worker doesn't wash their hands, they can transmit the microorganisms from patient A to patient B as seen here, or even when handling, they might be handling you know, the uh, urinary back in this case, but they fail to wash their hands before they actually shake hands with the patient or touch the patient. So that way they can transmit the germs from the urinary back into the patient, okay? So these are the different steps of transmission of microorganisms. So now part three, hand hygiene and prevention. Now, how do you prevent? Okay, so at least 50%, we should be thankful that at least we can prevent these healthcare associated infections. So at least 50% of healthcare associated infections can be prevented. And most of the solutions are simple. They're not very, uh, you know, very uh, uh, elaborate or very difficult to perform. Because as for example, hand hygiene is a very simple procedure to perform and you should perform these infection control procedures so that we can prevent healthcare associated infections. So you can see these are the strategies how to prevent. And one of them you can see in the general measures, the standard precautions, hand hygiene belong to the standard precautions. By standard precautions, we mean these precautions should be taken for each and every patient which you encounter. All right, so these are the precautions to which you should always take. So hand hygiene is, it comes under standard precautions. So hand hygiene, this evidence that hand hygiene is a single most effective measure to reduce healthcare associated infection. Okay, who is this? He's the pioneer of hand hygiene. That is Ignaz Philip Semmelweis. He's a Hungarian, okay? And when he was, uh, He's a, he, when he was posted in a hospital, okay, in two hospitals, when he was posted in two hospitals uh, uh, with uh, these obstetric wards, he was posted in two obstetric wards. What happened is that he saw that there was a high rate of infection in these two hospitals, all right? So he realized when he looked, means he observed, he was, his observation was very good because when he observed, he found that the doctors, were, there was an, after performing some autopsy, okay, so what they do is that even after washing their hands, they wash their hands, but their hands will still smell because the autopsies, when performing autopsies, there's usually a smell. So they usually go directly to the obstetric unit and take care of these uh, mothers, okay. So eventually he found that the, there's a high rate of maternal mortality in these two hospitals, okay. So later he just thought that the reason could be because they have not washed their hands properly. So what he did is that he asked the doctors to actually use uh, lime, okay? This uh, solution of lime, okay? Whenever after washing their hands to use a solution of lime before they actually handle those uh, mothers in the obstetric units, okay? And he found that you can see that after the intervention, there's a decline in the maternal mortality. So this is actually something which is evident from the decline of the maternal mortality. And he was uh, given the, I mean, he's the pioneer of hand hygiene and we should always remember him. But unfortunately at that time, uh, the doctors were not very uh, you know, convinced regarding this finding. But now we all know that this has been a very important finding which has been uh, seen by Semmelweis. So you can see, this is uh, the evidence over the years they found that if there's an increase in compliance of hand hygiene, you can see that there's a reduction of the 
healthcare associated infections. So all these studies were done in different parts of the world. So they all have the diff that, that same evidence that when there's an increase in hand hygiene compliance, there's always a decrease in the healthcare associated infection rates. All right. But however, the compliance with hand hygiene in different healthcare facilities, sometimes it is below 40%. So we usually observe even in our hospital also, some uh, wards or ICUs, they have a high compliance of hand hygiene as compared to other wards and ICUs. Even around the world also, they've, they've seen that looking at the healthcare professionals, they've seen that the compliance to hand hygiene is more with midwife and nurses and very low with doctors. Whereas in the different wards, they found that the compliance to hand hygiene is low in the ICUs. Okay, so the ICU also, they have various reasons why this compliance is low because actually in the ICU, they are very busy. Okay, and usually some of them, they tend to forget. So usually we often, keep, I mean, sir, that's why we always try to keep reminders regarding hand hygiene. So some of them complain that, when they use hand hygiene products, the skin irritation, or even some sometimes they have the false assumption that since they're using gloves, they need not do any hand hygiene. Okay, so these are some of the reasons why compliance of hand hygiene is very low. All right, so time constraint is also one major obstacle for hand hygiene. For example, hand wash, we do for 40 to 60 seconds. Okay, we do a minimum of 40, seconds when we're doing a hand wash. So this is actually a time constraint. For example, patients in the ICU, sometimes this time also, it becomes too much for them to do. Okay, so the average, usually when there's studies which are being done, they found the average time usually adopted by healthcare workers is lesser than 10 seconds. So we actually want to stress that you have to follow the time because this time we need that contact time between the microorganisms, okay, and the uh, hand hygiene product. So when there's not enough time, the microorganisms will not be killed, okay? So we need to do it for 40, 60 seconds when we're following a hand hygiene using soap and water. Okay, so other relevant obstacles which are given by different uh, setting is that there's a lack of facility. For example, certain wards don't have running water, okay? They do not have, uh, uh, you know, availability of hand wash, okay, or paper, paper towels. All these are obstacles where they are unable to comply to the hand hygiene practices. So one thing which is very, very good is that hand rub is the solution. For example, when I talk about an ICU setup, it's always best to have a hand rub because hand rub is usually, you, you, you'll have to do the hand rubbing, means the time period for a hand rub is much lesser as compared to a hand wash, all right? So you can see that, even though the time constraint is the obstacle for a hand washing when we do 40 to 60 seconds of hand wash, but for an alcohol-based hand rubbing, we do 20 to 30 seconds. That's why we always encourage that a hand rub be done in the facility. And also there's certain advantages of using a hand rub. You can see here, the green is a hand rub. So you can see that once you use a hand rub, the bacterial count will come down much faster as compared when doing a hand wash, okay? So what we have is that hand rubbing is more effective, it is faster, it is better tolerated. <coughs> so these are the guidelines. If you want to know more on hand hygiene, WHO has brought about certain guidelines. This is a book which is only about hand hygiene, which is brought about by WHO, okay, telling about what are the best practices when doing a hand hygiene, okay? So you have to remember that I told you sometimes it's difficult to remember in the workplace that you have to do your hand movements or you have to do your hand hygiene steps, okay? So always have in the workplace your five moments hand hygiene poster. You have to have a hand rub poster. You have to have a hand wash poster and a hand hygiene when and how leaflet should always be there in your wards or the ICUs. Okay, so coming to the part five, why, when, and how you should perform hand hygiene in healthcare. 
So this is one of the examples of the poster. You have to remind, are your hands clean? You have to clean your hands because that is the only way to save lives. All right, so why should you clean your hands? Because any healthcare worker, caregiver person, they need to be concerned about hand hygiene, especially when it comes to patient care. Therefore, hand hygiene, it does concern you, okay? You must perform hand hygiene to protect the patient as well as protecting yourself. So it's not about only protecting yourselves, it's about protecting your patients as well. So the golden rules, I want to stress on the golden rules for hand hygiene. <coughs> hand hygiene must be performed at the point of care. So whenever you take care of a patient, you have to perform hand hygiene at the point of care. That's why always a hand hygiene product, a hand hygiene hand rub has to be at the bedside where the patient is uh, lying down, all right? So it has to be performed at the point of care. And you have to remember the five moments of hand hygiene. You have to remember that hand rubbing, you always keep a hand rubbing whenever possible because it will be very efficient for you to perform hand hygiene at the point of care when you keep a alcohol hand rub. You should wash your hands with soap and water on visibly soil. Remember that, all right? So hand rubbing you can use when your hands are not visibly dirty. But if your hands are already soiled with uh, uh, the uh, fluids, the blood of the patient, you should always wash with soap and water and not use a hand rub in this case. And you must perform hand hygiene using the appropriate technique and the time duration. As I've stressed on the time duration, I said you should always keep with the time and use the proper technique to do a hand hygiene. All right. So these are examples of hand hygiene products easily accessible at the point of care. Okay, so if you do not have any stand or anything, you can carry it with you, one small hand hygiene uh, alcohol hand rub, okay? So can you solve this question? Which of the following is not included under my five moments of hand hygiene? I was talking about WHO five moments of hand hygiene. So which are not included under my five moments of hand hygiene. Is it before touching a patient, after touching a patient's surrounding? Number C, after a procedure, or is it D, before touching a patient's surrounding? All right, so most of you have correctly answered, okay? So before touching a patient's surrounding is not included under my five moments of hand hygiene. So you see, this is the five moments. What is the first moment before touching a patient? That is clean your hands to protect the patient against harmful germs which are carried in your hand. That's why you do before touching a patient. Before a clean or a septic procedure, you should clean your hands again. Why? Because you want to protect the patients from the germs which may be present in your hands. So moment three, after body fluid or exposure risk, again, clean your hands. Why? To protect yourself and the environment from the harmful germs. And after touching a patient again, why do you do this? To protect yourselves, okay, from the harmful germs. And after the touching the patient's surrounding, you should again clean your hands, again, to protect yourself and the healthcare environment against the spread of germs. So these are the five moments for hand hygiene. All right, before touching a patient, before any clean or septic procedure, after body fluid or exposure risk, after touching a patient, and after touching a patient's surroundings. So can you identify some examples of this indication before touching a patient? Okay, so why do you touch a patient? Anybody here online or on site? Hmm? Anybody, when do you touch a patient? Means what for you touch a patient? What are the activities you do when you touch a patient? It's okay, you just remove that. Okay, while giving injections and all that. Okay, so like shaking hands, stroking our child's forehead, applying oxygen mask, helping patient to move around. These are examples of before touching a patient, no? before taking pulse, blood pressure, 
abdominal palpation, recording EEG, ECG. These are all before touching a patient moments, all right? And can you identify before any clean or aseptic procedure? What are the procedures you talk about, the clean or aseptic procedures? Any examples? Yes, wound dressing, very good. Before injection, injection is a clean or aseptic procedure, isn't it? Yes or no? Yes, okay. So brushing patient's teeth before installing eye drops. When you, when you do any wound dressing, when you're giving some injection to the patient, catheter insertion, draining, uh, when you do, uh, you're going to access any draining system, or even before preparation of food, because food has to be clean, isn't it? So when you're giving food to the patient before, while before preparation of the patient's food, you have to wash your hands before giving medication to the patient, before any giving any pharmaceutical products or sterile material, you should always wash your hands, all right? So can you identify after body fluid or exposure risk? So some of these can be, okay, again, cleaning up urine, feces, vomit, bandages, cleaning of contaminated visibly soil surfaces. These are all examples of after body fluid or exposure risk, all right? So after touching a patient, examples, again, Okay, sometimes you go, you help the patient to move around, you take blood pressure. So these are all examples like after touching a patient, after performing everything, okay, which you do before touching a patient. So these are examples of after touching a patient, okay. So after touching a patient's surroundings, you can see the patient's surrounding. You're not touching the patient, but you're touching something like changing the bed linen, when the patient is out of the bed, monitoring the alarm, holding the bed rail, okay, handling the night table, clearing the bedside table. These are all examples of after touching the patient's surroundings. So all these are moments when you should do hand hygiene. All right, so how to hand wrap? We all know how to hand wrap. There are seven moments you can see, palm to palm, right palm over left dorsum with interlaced fingers and vice versa. Palm to palm with fingers interlaced, back to finger, back of fingers to opposing palms. All right. Rotational rubbing of left thumb. Rotational rubbing backwards and forwards with gloves, fingers of right hand in left palm and vice versa. So this hand rub, what is the time for hand rub? 20 to 30 seconds. What about hand wash? 40 to 60 seconds. All right. Okay. So just answer this, which is false regarding a surgical hand scrub. This is about a surgical hand scrub, all right? So is it the first surgical scrub of the day should be seven minutes? Is it the subsequent scrubs between surgeries can be for three minutes? Or is it nail brushes to be avoided? Hand scrub will remove some resident flora. So which is false? I'm asking about the false, you know, the false uh, sentence here. All right, anybody can answer which is false? Hmm? <clears throat> On site, any answers? Which one? So I can see some answers. C, D, any more answers? Any more answers in the chat box? So I'm asking about false, okay? You just close the chat box, let me answer, all right? So the, which is false, all right? So first surgical scrub of the day should be seven minutes, that is false, all right? You give, keep for a minimum of five minutes for the first, the first one, we said surgical scrub is very different from a hand wash or a hand rub, okay? Whereas a hand rub is 20 to 40 seconds, a hand wash is, 40 to 60, what about a surgical scrub? It will be for a period of three minutes to five minutes, all right? But the first one should always be five minutes. You need not go up to seven minutes, all right? So the, the point B, point B subsequent scrubs between surgeries can be for three minutes, that is correct. It is not false, all right? Nail brushes to be avoided, yes. Nail brushes need to be avoided because sometimes they can cause abrasions. All right, and D, hand scrub will remove some resident 
flora. That is also true. Understand? Hand scrub, I'll talk about resident and transient flora. So hand scrub will remove some resident flora. That is true. Nail brushes has to be avoided. Okay, while well, doing a surgical hand scrub and the subsequent scrubs in between surgeries should be for at least three minutes. That is a surgical hand scrub. All right. So can you do the next one? Which of the following statements are true? A, is it resident flora of the skin comprises of multi drug resistant organisms? Or is it B, transient flora of the skin comprises of multi drug resistant organisms? Or is it C, resident flora can be easily removed by routine hand wash or hand rub? Or is it D, resident flora can be easily transmitted among healthcare workers, which is true? There's only one sentence which is true. All right. True, true. I'm not asking about false, all right? I'm asking about which is true. <laughs> which is true on site? Can you answer? Which of the following statements are true? All right, so I'm going to answer, okay? So resident flora and transient flora are flora which are present on the skin. So resident flora is a part of the normal flora, which we call normal flora. No? It's a part of our system already. So this resident flora, it comprises of flora which are not multi-drug resistant organisms because multi-drug resistant organisms usually constitute the transient flora. Transient flora is that flora which you get while handling patients, okay? Suppose a patient is having a multi-drug resistant organisms and you handle the patient, which I've shown earlier, that is a transient flora. It'll remain in your skin for some time, all right? Whereas a resident flora is a part of you, okay? So resident flora will comprise of uh, organisms which are not pathogenic, whereas a transient flora, it comprises of multi-drug resistant organisms. So which one is the right answer? The right answer will be which one? Hmm? B. Okay, transient flora of the skin, it comprises of multi drug resistant organisms. All right, because resident flora, it cannot be easily removed by routine hand wash. How long do we take? Uh, how, how long for a hand wash? 40 to 60 seconds. So, resident flora will not be removed in 40 to 60 seconds. Okay. And resident flora, can it be tra transmitted among healthcare workers? No, because it's a part of us. It cannot be easily transmitted. So I'll just show you what is the difference between resident and the transient flora, all right? So no, is it a normal flora? Resident flora is a normal flora, yes. And transient flora is not a normal flora, okay? Is it pathogenic, resident flora? No, it's non-pathogenic. Whereas a transient flora, it is? pathogenic okay so transmission resident flora can it e be easily transmitted among healthcare workers no whereas in transient flora it can be easily transmitted all right so how do we remove this resident flora by a surgical scrub all right why do we do a surgical scrub okay why do we have to remove some resident flora because when you're exposing the patient during a surgery, you're exposing all the sterile sites. So even these normal microorganisms which are present in the body, which are present in your skin, can cause infection for that category of patients. That's why we always do a surgical scrub, okay? The main purpose for doing a surgical scrub is to remove a resident, some part of the resident flora, which can cause infection in a patient, all right? So, okay. So examples, see examples also, resident flora, these diphtheroids, propini, bacterium, corns, they are a, a part of a normal flora, a part of the human body. Whereas in case of transient flora, it, they contain all these multidrug resistant organisms, the MRSA, that is methicillin resistant, Staphylococcus aureus, Clostridium difficile, all these are part of the transient flora. All right, so which of the following is true again? <clears throat> Is it A, use of nail brushes is recommended? 
B, hand dryer is proven to be the most effective method of hand drying. C, use of hot water for hand hygiene increases the risk of dermatitis. Or is it D, using hand wash immediately after hand rub will prevent from dermatitis? So which is the correct answer? Is it A? No. Which is the correct answer? B. Huh? D or B? B. B. Okay, so the correct answer will be C. All right, C. Okay, so use of nail brushes, as I've told you before, it's not recommended. Okay, and higher hand dryer is not, not the most effective. We use disposable paper towels when they are available, not hand dryer. Hand dryer we use if the towels, uh, I mean the paper towels or the uh, cloth towels are not available. Okay, single use hand towels. All right, so use of hot, hot water. If you use, you have to use lukewarm water for hand hygiene, not hot water, because hot water will remove all your protective. You have fatty acids in your skin, which are protective, which are protective against microorganisms. So if you use hot water for hand hygiene, it will remove the fatty acids, which are present on the skin and make you more prone to get dermatitis or more prone to get infection. All right. And we should, and naturally we don't use hand wash immediately after hand rub. We either do hand rub or hand wash. All right. Next. Next thing. So in which of the following conditions mandatory hand wash is recommended? Any idea? Mandatory hand wash. I'm talking about hand wash. Hand wash means washing with soap and water. Hmm? Which is the answer? C. Hmm? So mandatory hand wash is always recommended when you handle patients having diarrhea. Having diarrhea because we do not want because Diarrhea may be caused by that Clostridium difficile, which I've shown you earlier, that microorganisms, uh, that microorganism, all right, that bacteria. So that bacteria will only be killed using soap and water. Okay, it'll be better handled using soap and water. So mandatory hand wash, I told you during routine clinical rounds, you can do hand scrub, or I mean hand rub, all right, using an alcohol-based hand rub. And when the hands are not vis visibly dirty also, you can use hand rub. Okay, even handling the patients having cough, you can use hand rub, but not the patients. When you handle patients having diarrhea, you should always go back and do a hand hygiene with soap and water. All right, so glove use, because most of the people have the impression that once they use their gloves, they need not do hand hygiene. Okay, so gloves plus hand hygiene, clean hands without hand hygiene, there'll be germ transmission because microorganisms will multiply in your hand when you use gloves, okay? So inside the gloves, the microorganisms which is present in your hands will multiply, all right? So it does not replace, use of gloves does not replace the need for cleaning your hands and you should remove gloves to perform hand hygiene, okay? When an indication occurs while wearing gloves. So it means that, okay, you should always do hand hygiene before, and after wearing your gloves, all right? Can you answer this? False regarding glove use. Can you, which is false? Which is a false sentence? Is it visibly soiled gloves should be removed? Gloves should be removed after four hours of continuous use. Gloving is not a substitute for hand hygiene and gloves can be worn the whole day if sanitized in between. Which is false? Just see the answer. Which is false? Uh, so most of you have uh, answered D, which is correct. It cannot be worn the whole day, even if you sanitize in between, because if you sanitize, what will happen is that there'll be small micro holes, you know, the, which you cannot see using the naked eye. So some, it becomes weaker. Once the gloves are sanitized more frequently, it becomes weaker. So there may be small, small holes which will not be visible to you. 
All right, so through these holes, the microorganisms can enter. So gloves should be removed. Ideally, after four hours of continuous use, if you were to use gloves at all, you'll have to remove it and replace the gloves after four hours. So within the four hours, you can sanitize, but not the whole day. You cannot sanitize the whole day. All right. So what are the key points when indications? So always use gloves before and after. I mean, always do a hand hygiene before glove use and after glove use. All right. So why do we observe hand hygiene? Sometimes we do auditing. You've seen that we come and audit and see whether you're practicing hand hygiene or not. So the purpose is to see whether you're doing uh, hand hygiene, you there's compliance with the hand hygiene practices, keeping in time the moments or the time period. All right. And the results, why do we, why do we need those? It's not to punish you. It's to identify the most appropriate interventions. For example, we see that when they are not performing hand hygiene, we find out the reason why they're not performing. Like I told you certain reasons is that they are too busy sometimes, or sometimes a hand hygiene product may not be available, or they do not get a continuous water supply. So all these are factors which should be, I mean, which should we should uh, have intervention, okay, to solve these factors. That's why we are doing, we are observing, we are doing auditing of hand hygiene practices. And finally, some, uh, they do not have very good knowledge regarding hand hygiene. So it's a way of educating them as well as training them. All right, so remember that it is always possible to remove hand hygiene, your, uh, to improve hand hygiene your facility. And it is your duty to protect patients as well as yourself. You can make a change and easy infection control for everyone. That's why you have to perform hand hygiene because this simple measure can save, actually save lives. So that is all regarding my uh, presentation. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Clarissa. It was a wonderful session. So <laughs> I mean, if you may have some question regarding any of the topics, what you can do is you can type it in the chat box. We can come back later during the discussion session. Or you can also ask the questions. Right now, if you have any questions, please type it in the chat box. We'll come back during the discussion session. We will also have demonstration, so you'll have a better idea during the demonstration session. However, as of now, please type it in the chat box. So thank you again, ma'am. It was a wonderful session. So you have gone very in detail regarding hand washing for everyone out here. So what we'll go to is now we'll go to the next session. That is bundle care approach. First is bundle approach for prevention of catheter associated urine tract infection by Ms. Rebecca. Please wait, welcome her. And Rebecca, you can start the session now. Okay. Uh, am I audible to everyone? Backside also, I guess. So I don't need further introduction, I think. The presenter has already introduced me very well. So today, uh, as ma'am has uh, taken the presentation, she has said how a healthcare associated infection are transmitted. So in a healthcare setup, there are like uh, we are the healthcare providers. So through us also, we can transmit many infections. So as, uh, as per her presentation, she has said it nicely that the urinary tract catheter associated infection is one of the main cause in a hospital setup. So we'll be discussing now today about the bundle approach for prevention of catheter associated urinary tract infection. Okay, so uh, before going through, we know we all know that our urinary system it comprises of the kidney, the ureter, the bladder, and the urethra. So when any part of this uh, system is involved, like is get infected by any microorganism, then it, it is called a UTI. It's called a urinary tract infection. So when in a hospital setup, when a catheter, a urinary catheter is placed to drain out the urine, maybe because of the immobility of the patient or maybe because of many other uh, purposes like a, a other urinary tract disorder. So we need a, a catheter to place inside the patient's body. So due to the prolonged placement of this urinary catheter, it comes a risk again that is a catheter associated infection. So that's why uh, today, uh, that's why bundle care approach is very important. And it is start right from the beginning of the insertion of the catheter until the time it is, uh, the, uh, till the time of the procedure and during the whole process when the catheter is placed inside the patient's body. So we'll be discussing one by one. 
So the strategy to prevent COT-T, it, as I said, is uh, start right from the time of the catheterization, then the, during the catheterization, and during the after the catheterization. So let's consider uh, what we have to consider before catheterization. So staff training. Staff, uh, staff training is very important. As Ma'am has said, we healthcare provider are uh, at a higher chance to transmit infection to the patient. So if the, if the person who's introducing a catheter does not know much about the way of trans uh, procedure about catheterization, we may uh, indirectly transmit introduced infection to the patient. That's why when a patient, when a person is inserting a catheter or a healthcare provider or a doctor, we should know that they, they know the uh, proper, proper procedure. Then we have to consider the catheter material like uh, like lactose or silicon. Some patients may have allergy to lactose. If they have an allergy to a lactose material, we can switch to silicon. Then the, we have to consider about the sizes of the catheter. Sizes of catheter comes in different, different sizes. It varies. But when we catheterize a patient, we start with the smallest size so that we will not, uh, uh, in, so that we will minimize the bladder neck expansion and also to prevent any kind of urethral trauma. And also, uh, we should remember that uh, when we are catheterizing the patient, antibiotic, prophylactic antibiotic is not recommended. So now what we have to consider during the catheterization. So during the catheterization, we should always know that is a, uh, we should always consider as if it's a minor surgical procedure. So we should always maintain an aseptic technique. We should always have a sterile cat for this catheter tray. And also we should have a closed drainage system that is our urometer or a urine drainage bag. Then we have to have an antiseptic solution. Uh, it could be either 0.2% of chlorhexidine or proviton iodine to clean the uh, genital area before the insertion of the catheter. Then we have to have a, a sterile lubricant gel that is 2% lignocaine into the urethra. In case of female, uh, uh, since the urethra is small, we can lubricate it three, like uh, three, uh, six inches. And then in case of male, since the urethra is longer, so we can take a, like a pre-inject the lubricant, like take a 5cc and pre-lubricate into the urethra so that uh, it will be uh, like, there will be easy penetration of the catheter. Then we use a sterile catheter and with the uh, use non-touch technique, we insert the catheter. And then we make sure that after the insertion, we keep the periurethral uh, area clean and dry. And we have to, Secure the after insertion, we have to make sure that the catheter is not uh, placed loose. We have to make sure that it is secure properly. It has to be secure at the upper thigh. And the way of uh, the way uh, and the way of uh, securing the plaster is that first we put the plaster onto the skin, then on top we took the tube, and on top of that we secure with the plaster. That is the way of securing the catheter. We don't directly secure the catheter to the skin. Before doing that, we just put a plaster first, then we took the, uh, then we place the tube, and on top of that again, we place the plaster. This is how we secure the catheter to prevent any kind of urethral injury. So now this, that was about uh, uh, what we have to consider during the catheterization. Now what we have to consider after catheterization. So these all meter vaginal care, drainage bag, emptying the drainage bag, specimen collection, removal of catheter and bladder irrigation we'll discuss one by one. So in case of meter and vaginal care uh, in a hospital, if a patient is conscious and uh, he can walk by himself, so daily bathing or showering, uh, he can do, he can, he or she can uh, do by himself and like he's just clean with soap and water once or uh, once and with uh, with water two, two or three times a day and make sure that it has to be patted dry. And when it comes to unconscious patient, we have to give perineal care, uh, like in our ICU setup, we used to give perineal care every shift. So we used to just give, uh, if it's there, chlorhexidine is there, we just give it the chlorhexidine, uh, chlorhexidine and there is normal saline is there, so we do with a normal saline solution. So, so, and then while giving the catheter care, we should always inspect for, like inspect the catheter if there is any breakage or any leakage, or we have to see even the drainage system, whether there is any discontinuity or disconnection is there, we also have to see it all together. Then if there is any fecal incontinence, perineum has to be clean, and then uh, the catheter has to be 
changed. So in case of drainage bag, we have to see that the drainage bag, the bag welded with drainage tube with no return work. Uh, most of the Euro bag or Eurometer it used to have a clamp, uh, clamp, and we have to clamp it, uh, clamp it, and so that the urine, there won't be any backflow of the urine to the bladder. And then the bags also always have to be attached to the bed frame or a stand. And the bags should be always below the level of the um, patient's body. And the bag should be always above the floor. It should not be touching or lying on the floor like this. Then even during transport also, the when we are transporting patient like in ICU, sometimes we used to take the patient for CT scan or MRI. So with Foley's catheter, we always should make sure that the, 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 black, the drainage bag should be always below the patient's body or it should be clamped so that there won't be any backflow of the urine back to the bladder and it will not cause any further infection. Then uh, the routine use of antiseptic in Europe bag is not recommended. Then when it comes to emptying of the drainage bag, this, um, uh, um, this uh, drainage bag has, has to be empty every eight hourly or or earlier if it's full, third or fourth of the urine bag, we have to empty it. Not necessary that it has to be uh, eight hourly only, SOS also. So we have the drainage bag at the top and the, it has to empty through the, at the, at the top also we used to have a drainage a tube is there, we have to empty from there or at the bottom, Eurometer has at the bottom and drainage bag has at the top, it has to empty through the pot. And it should be uh, completely empty. There should not be any remaining of the urine. Then, while emptying the uh, urine bag, it should be always uh, make sure that we to perform proper hand hygiene, like before and after uh, emptying, because the other person will again empty the other urine bag and it may lead to cross infection to the other patient. And then while emptying the uh, urine bag, it's not necessary that uh, we have to wear only a sterile glove. You can just use a non-sterile glo gloves or a single use glove for each bag and maintain hygiene. Then for every outlet, we have to always use an alcohol swab before and after emptying. Then about the container, when you drain the urine from the urine bag, it should be always separate for each patient. Uh, uh, in our case, in our medicine ICU and, and the other ICU, we used to, when we have a universal precaution patient, we have a separate jar for them to drain the urine bag. So, and uh, when we drain the urine, we make sure that the universal precaution patient's urine bag are empty at the last. Then we have to avoid contact between the tap and the container. There should not be any kind of contact between the urine bag at the top and the, the container. Then it has to, the container has to be again disinfected and stored dry after each use, or if it's disposable, we just dispose it up. Then it should be tilted during storage. Then now specimen collection. So when a patient is with a catheter, uh, most of the time we used to get order, like we have to get, uh, get a urine CS or urine RE from a, when a patient is with catheter. So most of our catheter does not have a port, so uh, we we just used to we can we show something? can we show? Yeah. So like suppose a, uh, a catheter is uh, in situ in the patient's body. So when we are asked to collect a urine RE or urine CS, many a time happens like um, some staff, they used to disconnect disconnect the tube, disconnect the connection between the catheter and the uro bag. That has not to be practiced. Actually, when you are asked to collect any sample, like in Western country, there will be a kind of a catheter where there is a separate uh, collection port is there. But in our setup, we don't have that kind of port. So instead, of discontinuing the connectivity of the, the catheter and the, uh, the euro bag, what we do is that before any sample collection, we make sure that the tube are uh, clean with the alcohol swab or chlorhexidine solution. And then there's a gap between this uh, this catheter, catheter and the uh, catheter and the euro bag. You just with a sterile syringe, we just pierce into it, and through there only we collect the sample. So, and the sample also should always be uh, obtained from the pot, not from this euro bag. It should not be obtained from the bag. And as I said, it should be always a closed close drainage system. 
it should not be disconnected. Uh, the continuity it should not be discontinued in whatsoever. So alcohol, as I said earlier, alcohol disinfection of the site, and it should be allowed to dry. So like, as I said, sampling pot, uh, it should be collected from the sampling pot, but which we do not have a sampling pot, so we collect it in that way. So it should be in sterile, and after collecting the sample, we put in a sterile container, and the sample, uh, if it's going to be transported within two hours, we don't need an iceberg, but if it's going to take uh, two hours, more than two hours, so we keep things, we store in a fridge. So this is, this is the way, uh, if there is a catheter which we have a collection port, we used to collect from that during sampling port, but here we don't have like this, so we collect in that way. So removal of the catheter. So the remove catheter as soon as possible when they are no longer needed because we don't want to have unnecessary infection to the patient. So as soon as the, uh, the patient can move and urinate properly, so you just take it, take uh, consider to remove the catheter as soon as possible. And bladder irrigation, if only, if there is any urological surgery only, like there is any bleeding post bladder surgery, uh, if there is no obstruction is there, then on uh, uh, then only you do bladder irrigation. Otherwise, normally bladder irrigation is not recommended. So this is the bundle care or uh, uh, audit, which our infection control team maintain every day. So that much uh, to say. So thank you so much. So that's all. Uh, thank you so much. I think the sound is not at, uh, audible to some person. Uh, may, whoever you cannot hear, can you please log out and log in again? Maybe the the issue may get solved. And also, it was a wonderful session as well, Mr. Baker. Thank you so much for the session. So uh, we will not waste any time and go to the next session. That is the bundle care approach for central line associated bloodstream infection by Mrs. Ivan Daker. So may I please request Mrs. Ivan Daker to start with her session. Thank you. So a very good afternoon and welcome to this session. So the session which I'll be discussing is on the bundle, bundle care approach for prevention of central line associated bloodstream infection. So as Madam has already explained about healthcare-associated infection before, the term was nosocomial infection or hospital-acquired infection, but the term has changed to hospital uh, healthcare-associated infections. So uh, I'll be discussing on the topic of CLAPSI, prevention of CLAPSI through bundle care. So what do we understand by CLAPSI? So CLAPSI, it's uh, basically an surveillance term which is used when a pathogen is recovered or is detected in a blood culture from a patient who already has a central line for at least two calendar days and there is no other infection in any other sites. So this is termed as lapsing. So bundle care. So what do we do? How can we prevent this clapsy or these infections that is happening? So in order to help us, there is a sort of a checklist in the form of a bundle care, which is evidence-based, which is evidence-based, like studies have been done and evidence is there that by practicing these interventions, there can be a decrease in these infections. So bundle care, it is a set of key interventions derived from evidence-based guidelines, which when implemented together, improve healthcare outcomes of the health outcomes of the patient. And adherence to bundle care help to deliver reliable and consistent care systems in hospital settings. So I'm stressing on the term together. So bundle, as you know, like it is a unit together. If you perform these bundle cares together, like without missing even a single factor, then it will be effective. But when the bundle care, if a single factor is missed or it's not being complied, then the whole exercise crumbles and it becomes to zero with the whole effort will be of no use, okay? So it should be practiced together. So it is sort of a checklist with, that will remind us as healthcare workers that we need to stress on these things in order to help our patients recover soon. 
So these are the portals of uh, points, points of access or portals of entry of microorganisms that can hamper the patient and uh, create a risk for him to develop clapsy. So you have to see that when you infuse uh, any saline to the patient, you have to see that the saline is, uh, the IV fluid is not contaminated. It has, it is clear and it is not cloudy or no sediments are present. And uh, the air inlet also should not be contaminated as well as the skin should be clean and the IV sets also should not be contaminated. So these are the risk factors of uh, development of clapsy. So insertion circumstance, what do you understand by insertion circumstance? It means that when, uh, when you insert, uh, the, when the catheter is inserted, the CVC line is inserted in an emergency uh, situation, like uh, we have to save the patient and it was done in emergency purpose, in emergency situations, there is a higher risk for the patient to develop because there is no sterile technique being um, practiced. So it will have a higher risk for the patient to develop <coughs> clapsy. And if it is an elective one, then it has a lower risk than skill of the inserter. So naturally, if the a person who will be inserting is skilled, there will be a lower risk as compared to a general clinician. Okay. So insertion site, the subclavian is preferred from the uh, uh, other than the femoral, the subclavian is preferred because femoral, as you know, that it's quite difficult to assess. And sometimes if the patient passes to and it becomes contaminated, so it is very difficult. And there's a higher risk of developing clapsy as compared to subclavian. So skin antisepsis, as uh, studies have shown that chlorhexidine is preferable to that of alcohol and povidone iodine because chlorhexidine has a, a longer residual effect. Okay, so catheter lumens, so more the lumens, higher the risk. Okay, then tunnel catheters, um, tunnel catheter, non-tunnel catheters have a higher risk uh, compared to the tunnel one. Okay, or permanent catheter. So barrier of insertion, if maximal barrier is recommended, like uh, we have a checklist, I'll just show you. So this is a checklist which we have, uh, which we practice in our ICUs. That this checklist ensures that the person who will be inserting has done his proper PPE and he's maintaining all these uh, septic techniques while insertion and uh, full body drapes should be used in, in place of uh, just an eye towel because the guide wire of the uh, CVC, it is long and it might touch any unsterile part, part while insertion. So a full body drape is recommended. So this is a checklist which we have. So our uh, NOs will be observing the person who will be inserting and will be filling all these uh, checklists. Okay, can anyone answer this question? Which of the following is associated with the lower risk of de development of clapsy? You can answer in the chat box. Okay, most of you have answered correctly. So yes, it is B, use of chlorhexidine is preferable to that of povidone ID. So prevention of clapsy using the bundle care approach. So first of all, strategy to be considered before and during uh, catheter insertion, selection of, we'll be discussing each factor in detail. So selection of catheter type. So there are mainly three types, periphery inserted central line catheters, big example is a non-tunnel catheter and tunnel catheter like Hickman, and implanted ports like a portacath, which is used for um, CA patients, terminally ill patients. And this is the port which is usually used for our CA patients. So these are the types, tunneled and non-tunneled catheters. So the non-tunneled catheters is um, very common in the ICUs, which we use. And it has a triple lumen. Mostly we use a triple lumen catheter. 
So selection of the site, as mentioned earlier, the best site is uh, preferable is subclavian other than jugular and femoral because there is a risk of infection is highest in the femoral vein and jugular vein. The proximity to oropharynx and there's increased skin temperature and it's quite difficult to maintain the dressing when the patient is sweating and he's, the temperature in that area is quite higher than as compared to the subclavian. So it must be secured with sutures or clips to prevent catheter movement or dislodgement. So hand hygiene has been stressed by Madam. Hand hygiene, always maintain and always comply to your hand hygiene uh, with the maintaining the five moments as well as the seven steps. And also the timing is important that contact time is required so that the germs which is present in your hands or on your gloves will be, uh, will be removed. Okay. So hands must be disinfected prior to catheter manipulation and whenever indicated, then the use of sterile gloves when we do need to use when the, we are collecting a blood sample okay, for culture, then for change, during changing of dressings also we should use sterile gloves. Okay. Skin antisepsis, so chlorhexidine as mentioned earlier is preferable than that of, to that of ID. Then site should be allowed to dry before catheter insertion. Okay, then contra it is contraindicated in uh, in our infants less than two months of age because they are more sensitive to chlorhexidine. Okay, povidonidine is used as an alternative if there is no chlorhexidine or if there is a high history of uh, chlorhexidine sensitivity, povidonidine can be used. So strategy to be considered after catheter use. So this is our responsibility as, uh, as caregivers to our patient that we comply to these uh, factors, okay? Catheter site dressing regimen, scrubbing the hub, administration set, and replacement of catheters and assessing for removal. So we'll be discussing each factor. So catheter site dressing, you can see from the picture here, gauze dressing as well as transparent dressing. So when you use dressing, it should be sterile dressing, should be used to cover the catheter site, replace when the dressing becomes damp, soiled, or when or whenever they, you see that it is soiled. So while inspecting or while taking care of the patient, you have to change when you see these, that it is loose or soiled. Okay, so the frequency of changing of uh, uh, central line dressing is gauze dressing every two days, or earlier, if it is damped or soiled, or if it's uh, if it's oozing, that is oozing out, and you can see that it's oozing, you have to change the dressing. Okay, for transparent dressing, change every seven days. For tunneled, it is seven days, and implanted catheter till the wound heals, you can change the dressing. Okay, so catheter side dressing regimens uh, and maintenance of asepsis. So this is very important scrubbing of the hub because mostly we have seen like in our settings that we often miss this part scrubbing of the hub. So use a scrubbing device with an alcohol product, isopropyl alcohol such as chlorhexidine alcohol or 70% isopropyl alcohol can be used for disinfecting these hubs and stop cocks. Okay, then rubbing uh, for 10 to 15 seconds. Okay, I'll just, I would just like to show so an example. So as you can see, this is a CVC light, which has three lumens, okay? The distal, proximal, and the medial. So these hubs, when you use these hubs, remember that first of all, you have to clamp it, okay? When, whenever you manipulate, whenever you are going to uh, take out blood, blood sampling or giving medication, you clamp it first, then you remove the cap, okay? Remove the cap and you take a spirit swab, so what we do in our ICU is that we we at each bedside of the patient we have a a, a spirit swab or a container containing the spirit swabs and we drop it in rotation manner for at least fifteen seconds okay for fifteen seconds and allow it to dry we have to apply a bit of friction and rotating manner okay for fifteen seconds okay and we clamp it even keeping the cap also it should not be keep in uh, 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 downwards in this way, but it should be the uh, inside out, okay? So in this manner, and even the cap also, you have to scrub it, okay? So ensure the top of the hub is rubbed well, not just the sides. Then allow the hub to dry, prevent it from touching any other uh, things or any other unsterile parts, okay? 
So assess the stop clock on injection port only with sterile devices, draw blood for five to 10 ml blood, place it in a sterile tray. So what we usually see is that when they draw blood, like they always keep the drawn blood on the bed of the patient. So it should not be done. It should be uh, the, uh, kept in a sterile tray or an injection tray, okay? Then clamp the catheter and remove the syringe during any sampling when you collect your blood samples. So administration said, so drug and TPN preparation should be done under strict asepsis. Check all parenteral fluid for clarity, as mentioned earlier. If we, it should not have sediments, the IV fluids which we are going to uh, give the patient infuse on the patient, it should be clear, and the expiry date should be checked. Use of single dose vials for medications should be used clean vial with alcohol wipes and avoid use of multiple lumens. A dedicated lumen should be uh, like, as you have seen here, there are three lumens, right? There are three tubes, so distal, proximal, and medial. So each, each lumen should be dedicated for a particular purpose. So as like the distal lumen, is the has the largest bore. So this you can use for TPN, okay? And proximal can be used to this blue one. It can be used for your inotropes, okay, vasopressors. And for the medial, you can use it for uh, blood collection and for other drugs, okay? This, the distal one is also used for CVP monitoring, okay? So hop cleaned with alcohol wipes, kept dry and kept it, Cap if not in use, okay? If it's not in use, we should not, uh, we should not, we should always recap it. So change of administration set. Uh, if you're using your IV sets, remember to change every four days. And if you're using, you're, using, uh, you're transfusing blood or uh, lipid, lipid emulsions at the end, it should be replaced after the end of infusion. So replacement of catheters and assessment of removal. So a central line should, should not be routinely replaced unless complication occurs. And if it's done in an emergency uh, manner or emer emergency okay. situation, like sterility is not ensured, okay, so we can recite it after 48 hours, okay? If there is um, a blood culture, we, if there's a uh, blood culture comes out positive, we can reinsert in another site, okay, required and assess the need to remove if no longer required. So any device, if a patient comes with any device, it is a foreign body to him, right? So we should see that if it's no longer, uh, if it's no longer required, we should always, it should always be promptly removed, okay? So this is the central line maintenance bundle. Okay, so we should check every day. I think in our ICUs also, we have a certain checklist. And even in our surveillance form, I'll be showing you later. Uh, this We have a checklist and uh, these bundle care audits are done every day. So whether you have to check whether hand hygiene is being performed whenever you're manipulating your central line and alcohol rub uh, or alcohol uh, hub con decontamination, like scrubbing of the hub, I can show you. Uh, what? What we did from the infection control like uh, unit is that just to remind, to remind uh, our staffs, to remind them like a scrubbing of the hub. So we have kept signages in this way to remind them to scrub the hub. Okay, you can do similarly in your own settings also. So chlorhexidine for uh, two percent for dressing change and any if there's any local sign of infection. So the most easiest way is how can you how can you say that the patient has um, an infection on the site? The easiest way, like, yes, the patient, the, there'll be redness, right? On the site, there'll be redness. Then the patient might have fever and he might be irritable, other unusually irritable. And the easiest way is that when you touch the site, right? When you touch the site, if it's infected, it will the area will be warmer than the rest of the area. Okay, the, the, you, when you palpate, when you touch it, it will be hot than the rest of the area as compared to the rest of the area. So in that way also, you can assess that there's a local sign of infection. So 
and dressing change, as mentioned earlier, dressing change have to be done accordingly. And then assessment of readiness to remove it should be documented whether because we have seen that when, when it is ready to be removed, the documentation is not being done. And so if it's ready to be removed, you can just tell your physician, so like uh, if you have a per very good peripheral uh, line, why not try the peripheral line if not no longer needed for the central line to remain? Okay, so readiness to remove should be documented and prompt removal is advised, is recommended if no longer in use. So this is our surveillance form. So even here, you can see that we have the bundle care audit. And even in our ICU, they have a certain checklist in this manner. So daily they're checking and filling up these bundles. So thank you so much, patient listening. Thank you, Ms. Ibandake. So that was a great session. I would like to call now Ms. Lily to take the session on bundle care approach of continental associated pneumonia. And that will be the last session. And then we'll have the demonstration after that. And just for the participant, if you have any question regarding the sessions covered as of now, please type it in the chat box. We'll come back to it during the discussion session. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as discussed earlier, uh, whatever we have discussed is based on bundle care approach in prevention of healthcare associated infection. As you all know, patient comes with some sort of infection and they come here to get treated, but uh, after admitting to patient, they are admitting to hospital, you realize uh, they are getting some more infection from us, which we as a healthcare professional, we uh, lack in some prevention method, we missed out some method and we are giving them extra infection. So um, to prevent that one, we uh, most of the, the most common infection that a patient acquires in a hospital are these three the topic that we have taken up. There are some other infection, but we want to just focus on these three. And out of these three, uh, I will be taking the ventilator associated pneumonias. As you know, uh, Whenever you insert any device on patient, they develop, a, they are at higher risk of getting that infection. So uh, let me just start with my topic. So it is a pneumonia, okay, occurring when, uh, when you intubate your patient. When you are putting a mechanical ventilation on, on your patient, you are putting your patient at risk of develop, developing a pneumonia. Then it can be, uh, there are certain risk factor. It can be, uh, the first one is your host. Your patient might be a, a medical patient or post-surgical patient. Your patient might be immunocompromised. Your patient might be uh, malnu uh, malnourished. And your patient might be old. You're, you're not providing proper position to your patient. The level of consciousness of your patient, you have to... Uh, if your patient is not properly conscious, there, there might be chances that they might aspirate. Your patient might be on sedation, some sedation, some sort of uh, steroids, or they have some anti uh, previous antibiotic history that they are resistant to some antibiotic. They, they are at higher risk of developing pneumonia. And then when you are putting, as I said, when you're putting any device on patient, they have a higher risk of developing infection. So in this uh, ventilator associated pneumonia, you are putting a ventilator ET tube on patient and you are inserting some sort of device on patient and the patient is developing infection and uh, your, if you are reintubating your patient, sometimes it happens that the patient is not ready to be weaned off from the ventilator, but you uh, and you intubate the patient or sometimes your patient deteriorates, health deteriorates, then you are reintubating. There is always a higher chance of developing a uh, infection, then uh, we are, you are putting uh, some sort of device like say NG, NG tube or oral, oral gastric tube you are inserting, you are not changing your humidifier properly, uh, you're regularly, you're not checking your humidifier of your ventilator circuit, you're not doing proper suctioning, then you are putting your patient at higher risks of getting infection and healthcare professional related. What are those as uh, <laughs> Madam have already discussed, can you name them? Uh, you can just type in, in your chat box or those who are on site can tell me what are those. It's there in your slides also. What is a healthcare professional related issue that you are putting your patient at high risk of developing ventilator associated pneumonia? Anyone? 
from here on site. If you are not performing your hand hygiene properly, then you are not using the gloves or marks properly, okay? These are your risk factor. When you push, put a patient on ventilator, you are putting your patient at risk of developing the pneumonia, okay? So I have a question here. You can type in your chat box, which of the following is, following is not a preventive strategy for VAP, ventilator-associated pneumonia? Is it semi-recumbent position? Is it sedation interruption, subglottic suctioning, or late mobilization? Not, you have to catch the point, not, not a preventive. You do everything except one. Okay, the right answer, everyone has rightly guessed it. It is D, late mobilization. So when you are, uh, when, whenever you have a patient, uh, you try to mobilize the patient as early as possible, not late mobilization. You are going to provide your patient with semi-recumbent position. You are going to give a sedation. I'll be coming to these topics. Okay, sedation, sedative interruption, subglottic suctioning you need to do to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia. Is it? It's not okay. So gen, uh, generally, what we do is uh, education and training. So uh, this is a sort of educating and training. Also, we are doing online, on site. Every time we are educating our staff to be aware of uh, how to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia. And uh, like Madam have earlier told us that surveillance, we do surveillance, we try to find out uh, what the prevalence of ventilator-associated pneumonia in, your, uh, in a healthcare setup. We try to do, we try to do surveillance, we try to find out what went wrong and what can be done rightly. Then uh, is it the staff living, uh, st is it staffing of the patient ICU? Sometimes we do have, uh, in some ICU, we do have one is to one staff is taking care of three, four patients. So uh, we are not able to give care to the patient optimally. And in that way, we are uh, lacking somehow and we are giving the infection to a uh, patient. And antibi antibiotic, rational use of antibiotic, uh, we tend to have a, a unnecessary use of antibiotic here. So we are we have to be rational in using our antibiotic in as you might be aware that in the near future we might run off run, run out of antibiotic and we will not have any antibiotic to treat our patient. So from now on we have to be very rational. Is it necessary for your patient to get antibiotic or not? You have to judge. Then a surgical patient, if you are receiving a surgical patient in a ventilator, you have to always advise them to stop uh, stop smoking and post operatively like i said you have to mobilize your patient as early as possible and analgesics should be used judiciously okay so specific measure these are some of the specific measure and we will be discussing it one by one so like i said semi recumbent position what is it it is you are uh, supposed to put the patient head and at 30 to 45 degree of angle or at highest angle possible because some patient you uh, might have some spinal surgery you cannot elevate that much but minimum it should be 30 degree okay what does it do it it will reduce your it will prevent in aspiration position uh, this position when you transfer your patient also you have to maintain the position and you have to uh, to, uh, to, uh, tell your patient also for to turn regularly to facilitate posterior drainage. Okay. So always remember it, when you are preventing VAP, you have to had, uh, have an head and elevation at 30 to 45 degree angle when your patient is on ET tube or ventilator. Okay. Then uh, sedation interruption, or we call it as sedation vacation. We do this one. So um, it uh, risk of uh, VAP is directly proportional to the duration of vent mechanical ventilation. The longer you keep your patient on ventilator, the longer, uh, the higher is the chance of your patient getting a pneumonia. So uh, what do we do? We try to reduce the 
ventilator days. So what we do, we do uh, we give daily sedation interruption and we have to daily assess the patient readiness to extubate. So what we are doing, you, are, you, you will always see in an ICU when the patient is intubated, your patients are always sleeping, but you have to give them an interruption or vacation so you have uh, in certain ICU, they have a daily routine. You stop the sedation at 6 a.m. like that. Then you will, during the rounds, when the doctor comes at 9, 9 o'clock, they'll try to see that the patient uh, can be extubated or not. Uh, and it during rounds, you, you are documenting it. You have to record it. But you have to always see that it should be balanced with pain. Because what happened, your patient is struggling and he has he's so much in pain or he struggles so much, there's always chance that your patient might extubate self-extubation, higher chance of uh, self-extubation. This should not happen. So you should not wait for the doctor rounds if your patient is not able to tolerate the uh, pain. Okay. A am I too fast? Is it okay? So stress ulcer prophylaxis, also you have to see uh, if ventilated patient has high, always higher risk of developing GI bleed due to stress ulcer. So you always, uh, you should always pay, uh, assess your patient and you should always try to give some pH lowering agent. It can be your H2 antagonist or PPI and anthacid. Okay, so most uh, most commonly what we use is your PPI, that is your pentoprazole infusion that you give. Okay, when you decrease the acidity, there is always also a chance of increased colonization. But you have or uh, you have to always but see that there uh, the what do you call? Uh, you also have to see that as the risk of aspiration also increases, but. So in order to decrease that, always we prefer that you always give a pH lowering agent. And it is uh, in some studies they have shown that sucralfate. If you uh, sucralfate, if you give the patient, it is best. Oral care. Uh, Oral care is also a must. You are, it reduces the colonization of your oral cavity. Then accepted regimen mm -hmm. is that you always give a chlorhexidine gel. You can apply it, okay, six hourly. That means in every shift you are supposed to apply and uh, you have to brush your patient to twice daily. Uh, sometimes what happens is chlorhexidine might stain the patient teeth. So teeth cleaning should be prior to uh, prior before you apply chlorhexidine gel. And also it act, uh, deactivates, inactivates the toothpaste. So make sure that once you brush, you wait at least two hours before you apply chlorhexidine gel, or you can, all, uh, you can do a, a mouthwash with chlorhexidine solution. Endotracheal intubation. So as much as possible, any device you put up, uh, put on patient, you have to judge properly whether the patient requires it or not. So in the same way, here it, it intubation also you should try to avoid as much as possible. Try using non-invasive positive pressure uh, pressure uh, ventilation first. Then if your patient is not able to tolerate, then only go with the intubation. Otherwise, always try with an IPVV. Okay. And then it is always if you if you are expecting that your patient will be on ventilation for longer period, it is uh, better that you use a silver coated endotracheal tube. Subglottic suctioning. This is also very important. You'll see that when you are intubating your patient, uh, there is pool of uh, uh, oral secretions collected above the ET tube. Okay, so uh, if you are expecting your patient to be on ventilator for longer duration, uh, there is this type. Uh, is the video here? Okay, uh, the, this type of uh, ET tube. If you're expecting your patient to be on uh, ventilation for long, uh, uh, change it this with this type of ET tube, which has a suctioning port. As you can see here, there is a suctioning port. You su do suctioning from here. What 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 is it? It this, it has a small opening here. So what does it do? Whatever secretion uh, pulls over above the scuff of the uh, ET tube, it gets sucked. Okay. The normal suctioning you'll be doing from the above ET tube, but uh, subglottic suctioning you need to do. 
Okay, then pressure also, you have to check the pressure of your etic tube always. You'll see that sometimes uh, while uh, doing uh, suctioning or anything like that, this uh, tube might deflate. So you have in every ship, you are supposed to check your uh, ET tube cuff pressure with this manometer. In an every ICU setup, you have this manometer. Every ship, you are supposed to check your tube. We will be demonstrating later on. We'll, uh, when, when we have the demonstration session. So this is a manometer. You should always have it in your ICU to check the cuff of your ET tube, which you should do daily, and you should maintain at least 20 mm of H2 water. Okay. So as I have already shown, uh, I'll, if you're expecting your patient to be on mechanical ventilator for long, you should change it with this type of ET tube, which has a subglotting suctioning port. Okay. So suction catheter, uh, it, it is always preferred if you can use a closed suction, close, uh, suctioning system because, uh, uh, but the, it is all uh, to reduce uh, risks of web, it is better you use a closed suctioning uh, system, but it's okay if you don't have in some hospital, you, uh, in some setting, we do not have a uh, closed suction system. It is, it's okay if you do the open suction system also, but uh, the risk of uh, developing ventilator associated pneumonia is almost the same. But what, what uh, the advantage is that if you are using a closed suction uh, System, closed suction system, it helps maintain the positive pressure in the ventilator circuit, okay, and there is less contamination. Then, uh, and it also reduces exposure of microorganism to the healthcare worker during suctioning because your patient might be having different kind of infection, uh, which if you're doing open suction, you might get, uh, be at a higher risk of getting the infection from the patient. Okay. So uh, when if you are using a closed suction system, uh, it should be uh, changed when malfunctioning or it is very dirty, then only there is no uh, such guideline, hard and fast guidelines that you should change within two days, four days, not like that. If it's malfunctioning, you can change it. Or if it's uh, dirty, you can change it. Okay. Then, uh, like I said, when you are, whenever you are uh, performing a suctioning on patient, you should always pre-oxygenate. You have to give a high flow of oxygen to the patient. After that, you will be doing a suctioning. So it, it should not be more than 15 seconds. And you can repeat it two to three times. And remember to flush the catheter. OK. So, uh, let me just this one. Like I said, always check the cuff of the pressure six to eight hours. That means you are going to check the cuff of the pressure, cuff pressure of the ET tube every shift. And you, if your patient is on tracheostomy, uh, tracheostomy, you have to check the dressing. Ventilator tubing uh, uh, here also, it is no, there's no mandatory, uh, there's, uh, it is not mandatory, uh, you will change it every seven days or 48 hours or uh, 14 days, nothing like that. If it's, uh, you will change only it is when it is damaged, visibly swelled or mechanically it is malfunctioning. And uh, sometimes what happened, your patient have so uh, so much of, you when you receive uh, pulmonary edema cases and all, they have so much secretion coming out from the ET tubes and all. So sometimes it comes to the ventilator circuit also. That time also, you can change it. So uh, this is a uh, HME filter. This uh, usually you should change it within 28 to 48 hours. This, uh, this is a bacteria filter also you call it. So you put it in front of your ventilator circuit. These uh, the guidelines, some guidelines tells you to change it um, every 48 hours, not uh, 48, 24 hours or 48 hours. You can do that. Or if it's uh, swelled and all, you can always change it. Okay. Nasogastric tube also, when you are uh, putting a patient on nasogastric tube, it uh, better, it, you should avoid it, but if at all you have to put, it's better that you use a small uh, fine bore tubes than larger variety, because what happened, and then uh, you have to see the regurgitation, uh, regurgitation if there is so much secretion in the, uh, so much 
fluid in the stomach also, it, there's always chance that you, your patient might aspirate. So when you put this one, you should always uh, see the chances of your patient getting aspiration. So you have to put a small, small, uh, small size tubes, then you have to always check the secretion in the stomach of the patient. When you are putting uh, smaller, you are reducing the chance of trauma and gastric reflux also. So like I said, we are all uh, today we are talking about all about bundle care. So in an ICU, in uh, in and mostly the your patient on ventilator will be in ICU. So you, uh, when you have an ICU, you should always have a checklist which tells you because we as a healthcare worker, when we are working in an ICU, we remember things. Uh, uh, whatever we have learned, but when there is a checklist, that checklist, then you remember, okay, this, 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 I have done. So always have a checklist to remind you. It, it acts as a reminder for you to do things which you might forget when you are busy. So there is a, you can always incorporate this checklist in your uh, ICU setup. And also uh, head and elevation in, a, in our checklist, we have this head and elevation 30 degree or above adherence to hand hygiene, then daily oral care with chlorhexidine Accident, uh, PUD prophylaxis, we have to assess this one. Then DVT prophylaxis, I have uh, not discussed about uh, DVT prophylaxis here, but it is also included in the web bundle. It is not uh, directly related in preventing uh, web but it is also part of uh, ventilator bundle. So what do we do in DVT uh, prophylaxis? Anybody? DVD prophylaxis, anybody on site? DVD prophylaxis in an ICU patient. What we are doing? Yes, talkings. Yes, good. Anything? Yes, anything? So in DVT prophylaxis, we do have uh, uh, stockings, we have pumps, we have a low molecular weight heparin uh, given to patient. Uh, provided it is not contraindicated in patient. Okay, then always we have to assess any, any devices on patient readiness to remove. As early as possible, all the devices should be removed from, from patient to prevent infection. So this is all about ventilator bundle. This is all included. I think I have discussed everything. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Lily. So we'll continue with the demonstration now. So, so can we start now? Dr. Clarissa, Ms. Lily. We can start with the demonstration, right? Yeah, yeah, we can start. We can start. Okay. So we'll start with the demonstration now. I request all the resource person, Dr. Clarissa, Ms. Rebecca, Mrs. Ibandake, and Ms. Lily to start with the demonstration. Just an ed just a submission from my side to the resource person. You know, like if you can redo the demonstration or equipments again, because you know the BP2 was visible. They may not have uh, seen when you're demonstrating through the videos. So I'll spotlight you all for everyone so that every day it will you will be visible to everyone. Okay. So just let me know if everybody like can you uh, view the screen where the resource person are visible? Okay. Uh, okay uh, everyone can see us. Give I, I, up. I think they can see you. Okay. Okay. Thumbs up. <laughs> okay, so first thing uh, we will be demonstrating on hand hygiene. Okay, so uh, like Madam have already clearly explained to us everything, but we have not discussed, uh, we have not shown you the demonstration of how to perform your hand hygiene. So we can use alcohol-based hand rub, mostly whatever, uh, what we use is a alcohol-based hand rub in every setting or not. And then we have we do have chlorhexidine based hand rub with alcohol. Uh, in critical areas, we advise uh, it's better that they, they use with chlorhexidine based hand rub, two percent chlorhexidine with seventy percent isopropyl alcohol. In a uh, in a sur for hand surgical hand scrub, it is uh, four percent. We recommend four percent iso iso uh, four percent chlorhexidine, and for general ward and all isopropyl alcohol seventy percent. So whenever you perform a hand hygiene.
So first thing, when you perform a hand hygiene, you have to remove all your ornaments from your hands, especially your uh, rings, watches, everything. Okay, remember to. And then you'll come, you, uh, whenever you see a hand rub, these days uh, due to COVID, everyone is conscious. Whenever you see a hand rub, your hand automatically goes to a hand rub. So whenever you go that, don't go directly like this. Put, use your back of your hands or your elbow. Okay, so uh, we are supposed to use, the recommendation tells us that it should be three to five ml. So what you do, back of your hands or your elbow, two good push. Each ml gives you two ml, so three to five. So we have to take two pumps. Okay, if you want more, you can do, but two is the minimum. What you do, what first thing is your palm to palm, five counts, one, two, three, four, five, palm to dorsum, one, two, three, four, five. We have two hands, so remember. So vice versa, one, two, three, four, five. And you do the interlacing, one, two, three, four, five. Do the uh interlocking what you do here you do the fingers tip and the knuckles one two three four five vice versa one two three four five do the thumb rotation like say circular motion one two three four five one two three four five tip of your fingers and bends of your nails is as important uh, as important because your uh, germs might be hiding there so what you do cl clockwise tip of your fingers one two three four five anti-clockwise bends of your nails one two three four five then vice versa remember two hands one two three four five bends of your nails one two three four five and finally the wrist one two three four five one two three four five if you are using a alcohol based hand rub it takes you only 20 to 30 seconds. By the end of these uh, steps, your hands will be dry and your hands are safe. Then when you're, if you're using hand wash, it will be 40 to 60 seconds. So you here what happened is we are using a soap and water. So the timing is more, but otherwise the step, steps are same. Then if you are doing a surgical scrub, it has to, you have to cover uh, three fingers above your elbow. You have to do in a rotational method. You have to cover all your arms also. And you have uh, what you can do is count into 10. And uh, each step you have to do 10 times. Even your wrist, you have to count into 10 times. The minimum time is three to five minutes. Uh, if, you're, if you think that you have not done enough, you just do the steps all over again. And it will be your three to five minutes. Okay, that's all about hand hygiene. They want to see that and read and instruction. Okay, for, I think most of you, some of you might not have seen the scrubbing of the hub as well. So what we do in our ICU is that each bedside, right, patient's bedside, we have a, a spirit swab container in place. And what we do whenever we manipulate, right, so we have to clamp the lumens okay clamp the lumens first and you have when you are wearing your gloves also on top of your gloves you can perform your hand hygiene okay by using your hand rub as shown by madam Lily earlier so open and keep this one tilted okay and then you scrub the hub okay in rotation manner 15 seconds okay 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 to 15 seconds, 15, okay, and allow it to dry, then you recap it, okay, so this is the scrubbing of the hub, okay. Uh, I'd like to just add here, uh, here we see a triple lumen uh, catheter. So always, uh, you, uh, most of the time in ICU, they are kept keeping this middle one for blood sampling. This is for inotropes and for any other injections and all. So you will just see middle one for blood sampling, uh, the blue one for uh, uh, this one, inotropes, and this one for any other injections. You can always keep it aside, this middle one for sample collection. 
Then uh, for urine uh, sampling from a police catheter, because we do not have the, like uh, our Madam here, Rebecca has told that we do not have the uh, sampling port type of catheter. We do have this normal catheter only. So what we are doing, if you do from here, you might deflate the balloons from the uh, catheter. So what you are doing, we are collecting from here. You are using a sterile syringe. Okay, so uh, in other setting, you might be uh, sterilizing, uh, you might be cleaning this area with isopropyl alcohol or betadine from here, this point. Okay, and then what you do, you, do, you have to wear gloves, you have to maintain the sterility, and then you can disconnect this part and collect the sample. And then from euro bag also, you, if your euro bag is new, then you can collect the sample from here also, if it's new. But if is an all one you should never collect the sample from euro bag and uh, like i said for checking the pressure of this uh, cuff of your et tube you can uh, see see in the manometer okay you don't need to worry it's already given this green mark you can see when you, whenever if you are working in an icu setup go back to your icu setup ask for a manometer it's always there 20 to 30 may it is green which is normal pressure. You have to check it when you put your cuff here. There is an inflating cuff here. So when you do here, you'll see that the, uh, can you, can they see? Okay, okay. So you can see that the <coughs> arm is showing at the low. So what you do, you gently press it in that green level. Me, You have to bring it there. Okay, once it is there, sometimes what happens, you press, press it too hard, it might go up. So what you do, you have a red button here. You, yeah. you have to gently press it to bring it to the normal side. Okay, so this is how you check your uh, ET cuff pressure and which you have to do daily. So uh, what, what happens if you don't check daily, your cuff might deflate and uh, you, there is a chance that uh, self-exhibition might happen, ET it, tube might dislodge, okay? I think we are done with the demonstration and all. Okay, thank you so much. Now I think we can open the forum for questions and discussion uh, to all the participants. Just a request to the participants who are offline, if you have any question, can you please you know ask so that it is it is audible to the participant in the chat as well so that they also know what is the question so i just request everyone to uh if you have any queries any doubts you want to ask something any suggestion you have please you can go ahead See the questions. Check the questions. So we have one question here. Uh, that is, uh, when taking sampling from subclavian catheter, do we need to replace back the first sample? That is the question by Dafahi Lingdo. Uh, may I request the ma'am to please answer a query? So the question was, if we are taking a sample from subclavian catheter, do we need, we need to, to replace back the first sample? Oh, okay. So the first sample, like what we usually do is like, right, we, we take the uh, around 5 ml or 10 ml of the blood, right? When we collect for sample. So when we keep it in a sterile manner, but sometimes, you know, due to busyness and due to like, uh, we cannot maintain the sterility. We keep it on top of bed sheets, on top of the bed of the patient. So sterility is being breached. So in that way, we cannot reinsert back. We cannot push back. But if you are maintaining that sterility, you can always flush it back, okay? Okay, thank you so much. We have another question for Miss Lady. What is the suction pressure for ET tube and oral suction? Can we uh, can we back 
uh, can we get back to the question later? Ah, sure, sure. We can do 20 that. To 20, to, uh, 20 to 25, but I'm not very sure right now. So I'll get back to you. Sure, ma'am. Sure. <clears throat> Uh, a question for Dr. Clarissa, how, uh, ma'am, how many times do we have to repeat the steps of hand washing for surgical hand washing? Maybe what uh, he means is that maybe within a day or so, if you can question that answer. How many times do we have to repeat the steps, steps of hand washing for surgical hand washing? No, that's what you'll have to repeat. Means it's the same way now in which you have to... Uh, do for the moment, all right. So I'm not understanding exactly what the question is about. Exactly. Uh, so me, Bakar Langi, if you can unmute yourself and ask the questions directly, okay. because your question is not very clear. If you're talking about the time which we require, you know that the time is three to five minutes and we usually count each step, we count 10, all right, 10 times so that we make sure that by the time we finish the steps, it'll be three to five minutes, all right. But how many times do we repeat for surgical hand washing? It depends on what you're going to do no? during the process of surgery, okay. So you'll have to assess and see the requirement for a hand washing. Suppose you're going to touch the, let's say the urinary bladder, which is inserted or something. Naturally, you'll have to wash your hands before you actually touch whatever equipments which are used for the patient. Okay, something like that. I hope uh, I've got through to you. I'm not sure. Oops, you have answered your question, Ms. Becker Lange. Hello. I think, ma'am, you have made it clear, quite clear. So we have to do the steps for five minutes when we are doing for the first time. That is seven steps, the same step, but we have to do for a longer duration. Than for a longer duration, because we have to ensure that at least three minutes minimum we are doing the surgical hand scrub. Yes. I think, ma'am, that will be fine. And another question we have. Uh, that is on catheterization. What is the minimal minimal minimum ml of distilled water we can inflate the balloon during catheterization, both for pediatric and adults? Um, well, uh, we inflate for adults. We inflate around ten to fifteen ml of distilled water for pediatric, five to six ml of uh, distilled water. Thank you so much. Uh, if a patient with male catheter, how do we collect the sample? I think they have demonstrated how to collect the sample, but uh, Can Walang, can you please uh, unmute yourself and ask the question again? Because they have demonstrated how to collect the sample from catheter. Yeah. So, please raise your question. Raise your hand, please. Yeah, you, you can unmute yourself and ask the question directly. Oh. What is the question? If a patient with male catheter, how do we collect the sample? I think we have demonstrated it already. Or is it for a male condom catheter? Bristerius, can you please unmute yourself? You can ask the question directly. I can, we can go ahead with the next question because you have already demonstrated that. So uh, the next question is how, after how many days do we need to change invasive tubes like ET tube, Riles tube, central line and Foley's catheter? So uh, there, for if you are talking about ET tubes and all, it is not necessarily uh, like it depends on the patient. 
See, if your patient doesn't need a tube for longer duration, you have to uh, you have to extubate your patient. If anything, like any lines and all, which is not required, you can remove immediately. But depends if your patient needs longer uh, due, due to some uh, med uh, medical factors and all, they need to uh, or be on intubation for long, then you have to uh, uh, judge and you have to talk with your doctor concerned that do the patient need longer intubation? So can we change it to tracheostomy or central line? Also, like we said, there is no hard and fast rule that you, the patient, supposedly if the patient has a good peripheral line and all, why do you want to put a central Central line on patient. So try to uh, uh, minimize the devices on patient. So as early as possible, you try to remove it. Uh, and even Ryle's tube, if your patient is eating, drinking and all, why do you want to put a Ryle's tube? If your patient is also like uh, passing urine, he's able to tell you his, he has sensation in your bladder and all, you don't need to put a follis catheter. As early as possible, you have to remove. And then follis catheter, if at all, if you are using a latex uh, catheter, there is a guidelines that uh, some days they are following 14 days, you need to change your follis catheter. If your patient is going to be on follis catheter and if you are using a silicone catheter, it is 21 days. I hope uh, I have cleared your queries. Uh, hopefully, yes, Supling, your question is answered. Uh, the next question is regarding in our institution, we collect urinary NCS sample by clamping the catheter first. And after some time, we remove the catheter and collect urine, but removing the pot. Is this type of method recommended? So they have written their process, how they, they are doing it, and whether it is the right method. So to answer to this, Dafri Sisha Marbanyang, it's written like in our institution, we collect urine RE and since by clamping the catheter first. Uh, that maybe I have missed out during the presentation, but we also, we do the same, that we clamp it first and we wait for some time. And with the uh, alcohol swab, uh, we collect the sample from where we are, uh, where we have, I have, uh, we have demonstrated. Uh, in Western, I like different, there are different kinds of catheter where there's a specifically a port is there, but in here in our setup, we don't have. So we collect through that connection between the catheter and the urometer. And then, uh, uh, and the collect urine, but removing the port. So we, don't remove the pore. Uh, if the catheter and the follies are sterile, like uh, like freshly inserted, when we we can collect removing the pot. But if it's uh, old, then we don't do that. We don't recommend recommend that. It's not recommended. This continuity of the catheter and the follies, uh, follies and the euro back is not recommended while collecting our samples. Thank you so much. Uh, hope Dafi Sisha, your answer is question is answered. Uh, if you have. Still, you have. If you have any doubt, you can ask again. You can unmute yourself and ask again. Uh, next question uh, is from Pramila. She want to know how we can minimize the infection catheterization of a prolonged disease. That is, if a patient is suffering from a disease from months to year, how do we minimize the infection from catheterization? Uh, so I think we have covered this in uh, Madam Rebecca has covered actually this one. So what we whatever we are doing in a bundle care that is to prevent the infection. So if your patient is on catheterization and has a has is. Um, is ho hospitalized or is at home and they have a catheter catheter with them. So make sure that your catheter care is given daily with uh with soap and water sometimes you can use uh normal saline in, in a hospital setup we are using normal saline we are not using betadine we do not uh, uh the cdc doesn't recommend any uh antiseptic to use for catheter care and all so you can use either normal saline or soap and water as you all know for personal care thing at home also we do not use any antiseptic for ourselves also as so so it, Likewise, for patients also, if they, even if they are on catheter, you do not need any antiseptic uh, solution. You can just use soap and water. Then you have to change the catheter 
14 days if you are using uh, if you are using silicon but when you are you are expecting the patient to be on long uh, longer duration of catheterization it is better you change it to silicon catheter which can stay longer like i said 21 days so i think and then maintaining the uh, bag of the uh, this one urine bag, it has to be always below the bladder, above the floor. So gravity does it work, uh, work. And when you are transporting your patient also, you should always maintain the uh, position when you are transporting also. You should not keep it on top of your patient while transporting. It so happened that we are, uh, when we are transporting the patient to some other location for some x-ray or something like that, we just keep the euro, euro bag on top of the patient. It should not happen. So you should always remember that it the below the bladder above the floor should be maintained. I think I have covered. Okay. So another question, I think this is in line with the question that has been asked before. That is, if a patient with a male catheter, how do we collect sample? Mm -hmm. I think what he meant was condom catheter. So he has just replied now. I think I think uh, if you have submitted the post this, please do not write submitted because the chat gets no left behind also what he was asking was for for condom catheter so i think condom catheter also i will just answer it but <laughs> so i think condom catheter also it always have a connection with the euro bag right so from there you can always uh, use an antiseptic solution clean it and from there you can tell your patient to uh, if, because your patient if your patient is on condom catheter that means he's able to tell you that he he wants to pass urine Okay, sometimes sometimes they may not have sensation. So what you do, you just uh, uh, clamp it. They, uh, you just clean it and try collecting sample. But I am also very sure condom catheter will. Are they able to tell only? No condom catheter. So they are able to tell only. So when they are able to uh, void, then you will collect the sample. But you have to make sure disinfect the uh, connection between the uh, bag and the condom catheter. Uh, thank you. Hope your question is answered now. Uh, we have another question. Do we need to claim the catheter before collecting sample? I think they have already said that. Just uh, with two questions prior, they have already answered that. Uh, we'll just keep that. Uh, do we need to heparin flask for central line and do we need to flask in every shift? Uh, this is a question asked by Srijana Pradhan. This is for central line. So usually uh, what the recommendation tells is that heparin is not necessarily, there is no evidence that if you are using heparin flush, uh, it will keep your central line pattern. You can always use normal cell line to flush it. But yes, every shift you need to check the patency of your central line. Okay, thank you. So another question we have is how to collect sample. I think we meant urine sample from a patient who is in diaper but not in catheter. Now this is. Uh, there, there is some. Um, if if the patient is in diaper and if you really need to collect a sample, so we just insert a catheter or maybe a straight catheter if it's there. Then from there we collect a, a sample for ure. I mean re or cs. I hope. Yeah. But maintain, while inserting a street catheter, we make sure that we maintain sterility for the required sample. Thank you. Hope you have answered your question. Uh, another question we have is if catheterization is contraindicated, what other options do we have? Now it's going out of context a bit, but <laughs> uh, what is the question? Uh, if the catheterization is contraindicated, what other options do we have? If catheterization is contraindicated, here what we practice is there if a catheter cannot be inserted through a urethra, so what we do is that we send a referral to a urologist and then they used to make a suprapubic uh, catheterization that is just above the suprapubic if it's not possible through a urethra. Okay. Thank you. Or maybe now, yes. Uh, another question we have, ma'am, how many days does we insert? I think what she or he meant is that for how many days we can keep the catheter. I think that you have already answered. Here we that. practice 14 days. Yes. So After have, every 14 days, we change it. I think uh, that are the questions. We have covered all the questions that are in the chat. 
group. And if any uh, questions we have from the offline participant, they can just ask on site participant, they can ask the question. And then we can go ahead, we can close the discussion session. So if no question, then uh, we'll just go ahead with the first post test uh, link they have already given and the feedback link they have also given there in the chat. So you can give the post test and after 10, just take another 10 to 15 minutes. We, what we can do is I will send you the WhatsApp group link. So whatever, whoever have not joined the WhatsApp group, you can join through that link. Ma'am, another question have come about, what about suprapubic catheter? How many days can we keep? Um, yeah, that uh, will be decided by the urologist. Normally, we don't because that is done by the urologist. They only they come into the pre catheterization. If there is no leakage or there is no blockage or uh, uh, there is no problem, so we continue with using. If there is, then we just keep uh, uh, ask the urologist to do the needful. Okay, so another question uh, regarding CVP line. How do we use transparent dressing for CVP line? We use a tagodome. Why do we use? Why do what is the why do we use transparent dressing for CVP oh, lines? so that uh, so that uh, we can see if there is any. Uh, like uh, the infection, is there any pus formation, red, redness, anything, irritation to the skin? So we can see it, see, see through it. So for assessment purpose only, we use a transparent tagaderm so that uh, we can see through properly. So I think she have answered your question. Nafisha Jala. So uh, anyone else who want to ask any question, you can just ask during this time. We have another 10 to 15 minutes that we'll give for post test and feedback. During that time, if you have any query, you can just ask now. I will also share you the WhatsApp group link. Just wait. Yeah, it is uh was it is six uh sixty two ETT pressure suction pressure here they are asking again so uh, when you are uh, doing a suctioning on patient you have to maintain a pressure of sixty to one twenty for an adult patient. Okay. Uh... So another question we have, I think, how many times do you need to class the CV line? <laughs> Same question. I think you have answered that one. Every yeah, shift. That one. <laughs> so we need to do that every shift, right? Yes, every shift. And whenever you assess the port, you have to flush it. Yes. Um, I think another question is there, which line has the highest risk of collapse? I think this they have covered during the session, but ma'am, they are asking so. You can just repeat it once. Which line has the highest risk for clepsy? You, if you mean the site, it is the femoral site has the higher risk of developing clepsy. Otherwise, all the other site also there is chance if you don't scrub the hub when you are assisting a central line, you should always remember to scrub the hub, maintain sterility. So I've shared the WhatsApp link in the chat. So whoever is not part of the group, you can join the group through that link. And all the PPTs and the resource material will be shared in the group.
I think, ma'am, now we can just, uh, we have a small token of gift for our resource person. And we'll just do the distribution right now. And whoever have not done the post test and feedback, you can go to the link and do that. But uh, what we'll have a small token of appreciation for all the resource person because they have given out that time today to uh, give us this beautiful session on infection prevention and the bundles. And so I would just like to call uh, uh, Rida Kher Kong Kongla, Chief Nursing Officer, if, uh, are you there? Yeah, hi. Yes. So Rita Kher Kongla, Chief, sorry, if my pronunciation is wrong, I'm really sorry. Yes. Chief Nursing Officer from Negrims to felicitate Dr. Teresa, ma'am for her presentation today and her input today. Thank you, ma'am, for your time and the guidance you have given us today. A big applause, everyone. Oh, that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> so you can just move once here also, once there also, so then they can have a beautiful picture out there and a beautiful picture out here also. <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am. Now, uh, I would request Dr. Clarissa, ma'am, to give a token of love to Miss Rebecca <laughs> for her she have taken some wonderful session on the bundle of care approach for Coty. Thank you so much, Miss Rebecca. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, again, uh, I would like to disturb Dr. Teresa Mem <laughs> to give another token uh, memento to Mrs. Ivan Daker, the China. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. And I would not let Dr. Kresha ma'am to sit again and see because you have to give another token moment to Miss Lily. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was a great session, everyone. And lastly, a, a big heartfelt thank you to everyone, especially to the resource person, the Negrims team. You have been really helpful for this. And I would also like to thank our Chapaigo team, Nanuka there, who have been always coordinating out there, talking with you all, doing all the stuff. <laughs> thanks, Nanuka. Thanks, Jotiji. Jotiji is here. Then uh, uh, thanks to mm -hmm. all the participants, because without the participants, this session would not have been possible. They are very active, asking any questions they have, and also, you know, they are always informing us that they have submitted the test and please and post this. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you, everyone. It thank has you so been much. A session. Nanuka and team. Yes, your Nanuka is like thanks to her. <laughs> thank you so much. Any queries you have, you can always reach out to Nanuka. She's always always available, and I'm also always there available. I think, ma'am, we have certificates. I think you will get there after you have submitted the pre and post this according to the marks. You will get the certificates. Don't worry about the certificates. So thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you.